The John Morris Show, episode 97. In this episode, I'm going to address your pushback on yesterday's episode and answer what WordPress e-commerce theme you should use. The John Morris Show. Your life on code. Ladies and gentlemen, John Morris. Hey everybody, welcome back to The John Morris Show, johnmorrisonline.com. This episode... I'm going to address some of the pushback that I got yes from yesterday's episode, and then I'm going to also answer some of your questions. So in yesterday's episode, I talked about what I thought, the way I thought the next 10 years were going to go in technology. And I thought I really see the growth of new development tools being built and becoming better and better. And they're really kind of two different directions developers are going to go. One is tool building and actually building those tools that other developers will use. And then also tool using, which is actually working with the the end client building websites and different things and so forth. And during that, I talked about the, or towards the end of that, I talked about the fact that, you know, a lot of clients, they don't really care how you deliver the end result for them. And and that was the big point of yesterday's yesterday's episode was moving away from a language mindset to a end result mindset. That at the end of the day what clients care about are end results, not the languages that you know. Right? Most of them don't even know what that stuff means. Now, I got some pushback, I got several of these that I want to go through. So the first one was Okay, someone said many clients care do care about skills. That's why freelance sites have tests. Now, first off, I, I think it's important to make the distinction between skill and language. Now, yes, clients care that you're skilled. They care so because they want to know that you can deliver the end result. And that was really the point that I'm I was trying to make and that I am trying to make is that They may talk about the language, they may know what the languages are, they may have heard of them, so forth. That's all fine and well, but they don't really care about the language, not like you do, right? If you ask a developer, you could go ask 100 developers about, say, PHP, and you probably get a bunch of different opinions. Some love it, some hate it. Go ask 100 clients about PHP, and most of those clients would probably be like, eh, They they don't really know, they don't really care. They don't care about it like you do. So trying to sell yourself to a client by geeking out on what you know about PHP and all the different PHP skills that you know isn't going to do anything for you. They don't really care. Now, they may know what they are, right? They may know, okay, well, I need somebody who knows PHP, but only in the context of the end result that they're after. If you came to them and said, for example, Hey, I can build exactly what you want. It'll do everything that you wanted to do. It's going to be awesome, blah, blah, blah. I have all these testimonials. I have all these portfolio items. The one caveat is, is you said PHP and I happen to build an ASP. Now, unless there's some sort of conflict with something else that you're there using, most clients are going to be like, okay, what does that really mean? Is that really that big of a deal? And you could probably convince them to hire you to build the site for them. As long as you have, you know, you have the the proof that that you can deliver. They don't really care that much. Okay? And that's the point that I was trying to make. Developers constantly try to sell themselves on the languages that they know. Go go to any freelance profile. Uh, 90% of them you're going to see it. It's all about the languages they they know. Clients do not care about that stuff. Only in the context of if they've learned from somebody that that's the thing that someone should know in order to get them their end result. What they really care about is their end result. So yes, freelance sites have tests. That's because that's an indicator of maybe you know what you're talking about uh, when it comes to this language that that client has somewhere learned that the developer they need to hire needs to know in order for them to be able to deliver this end result. It's like Ajax. You probably have clients who've heard of Ajax, but do they really know what it is? No, they just know that the forms that use Ajax tend to work pretty cool. And that's what they want. They want a form that works like that. Now, if you could do that some other way, they probably wouldn't really care. Okay, so 
yes, they know what they are. Yes, they think about them, but they don't really care. And that was my point. The next thing, some some pushback that I got is uh, someone said, well, coders, like peer coders, will always get the top 20% of clients. And so, again, this was going to the point where I talked about there will be tool builders and there will be tool, tool users. And there's going to be plenty of room for both. And so this person is saying, well, but if you know how to code, peer coders will always get the top 20% of clients. Again, where does that statistic come from? What numbers is that based off of? That's what I'd like to know because 20% is it's kind of a random number, okay? So where does that come from? If you have some stats, I'd be more than happy to look at them. But my hunch is that that's just your opinion, which is fine. You're 100% entitled to your opinion. I just happen to think that it's wrong, right? Because I, I don't think that, again, clients really pay that much attention to someone who's a pure coder versus someone who's a site builder, right? Or uses tools. Now, again, if they want something built specifically that requires you to have to write code in order to do it, okay, that may give you a leg up, but most of the time, most clients you're going to work with, that's not the case. There's usually a tool out there that will do it. Now, I do want to point out, I didn't say yesterday, don't learn how to code. I actually said that there's value in learning how to code and that it is helpful to know that. But my point was more, you shouldn't feel bad if you're using tools to deliver end products to users. It's perfectly okay. Code that writes code, <laughs> that's I think that's going to become bigger and bigger in the future. And people who do that use those tools, they're 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 perfectly fine doing that. That doesn't make you less of a developer or coder or so forth. Now, there's a way to know if you're more of a peer coder versus someone who's more of a, a tool user. So if a tool builder versus a tool user. If what I just said, talking about it's perfectly okay to build sites using tools and you know you don't have to code everything from scratch yourself, if that's like nails on a chalkboard to you, if you want to reach through the screen and choke me and scream at me, then you are likely a tool builder. And that is 100% okay. You are more into the code and the code is something that really like it matters what code, how the code was written, what language was used, etc. That stuff really matters to you. I, you know, I'm with you in a lot of ways, but you are definitely a tool builder. And so understand that going forward, you can keep writing code, you can keep doing that. But chances are you're, you're going to do less and less website building and working with end clients who aren't technical and more tool building and working with developers who are ultimately going to use the tool that you're building. Now just look around the ecosystem at the things that are coming out that are kind of big in tech and that's what you're seeing. You're seeing tools being built for developers by peer coders and then there's other people using those tools to build the end product for clients. Okay, so that's <laughs> understand that that's the direction for you. Now, if when I said that stuff you were someone who's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Or maybe even it was like an epiphany. You're like, wait, I don't have to code everything from scratch myself. Then you are likely a tool user. And the thing that I would, the point I was trying to make for you yesterday is that is okay. You do not have to write everything from scratch yourself. It's okay to use tools. And in many cases, it's better to use a tool. It's better to use a WordPress, even though there's plenty of pure coders out there who will be like, oh my God, WordPress is so terrible. Well, let me, let me give you a little hint. The thing that you wrote from scratch is probably a hundred times worse than what WordPress is. That's just the truth. I know you don't want to hear that, but that's just the truth. Okay. Now, if you spend the next five years developing it, maybe you can develop something that competes. But if you sit down today and in three days write something from scratch, almost guaranteed it's going to be a hundred times worse. That's just the reality of it because yours hasn't been tested and poured through and built upon and, and gone over by a community like WordPress has. So hate on it all you want, 
but chances are you couldn't write any something any better than it, okay? So, again, in that instance, that tool is probably better than anything that you could write from scratch, and it's okay to use it. It's okay. You're not less of a developer or any of that. Now, again, there's value in learning how to code to be able to change the tool how you want, right? Say a WordPress plugin that adds functionality that isn't built into it. There's a ton of value in that, but it's okay to build stuff that <laughs> uh, using tools, using existing technology. All right, next one I got is someone said, well, Peer coders, people who are peer coders, they think about end users. As a software engineer, that's all that I think about. Now, again, you know, I want to point out the difference between what it, the, the person is thinking I said and what I've actually said. I, I don't think, I'll go back and listen to it, but I don't think I ever said peer coders don't think about end users, right? My point was is that peer coders, they care more about the code and they really don't necessarily like working with clients. Now I'm generalizing, absolutely. I'm someone I would consider myself, I don't know, peer coder, but I definitely enjoy the code part of it, but I also like working with clients. So I have a little bit of both in me so I, I can understand both sides. But what I find generally with the people that I work with and the people that I talk to, and I have a lot of people that I get email and messages from and so forth is, Pure coders tend not to like working with clients as much, right? They'll do it if they have to, but they really like, they're really into the software part of it, the, the actual application and the product development. That's what they're really into. Whereas people who are tool users, again, they don't necessarily mind going in or and coding if they have to, but usually it's kind of annoying if they have to go in and write some code to make something work. I, through my career, have moved from the peer coder <laughs> to the tool user a little bit more. And if I can find a tool that'll do what I need to do, I, I, I'm 100% fine not reinventing the wheel. I, I care more about, I, what I like is working with a client and seeing their face light up when they see the end result and going, oh, finally, you know, that's what I enjoy, right? So. Again, both are completely fine. I'm not knocking one versus the other. I'm just saying in the future, that distinction is going to become more and more clear. And you really have to understand what you fall into and which direction you should start heading. Because if you want to be a peer coder, it's going to get more and more competitive. It's going to get more and more difficult. And you really have to know your stuff. If you're a tool user, it's kind of nice because there's going to be a lot more stuff coming out. But you have to understand that you're going to have to start learning how to use different tools and get good at picking the right ones to use that are going to be around for a long, long time that you can really invest your time into. All right? So you need to know which, which camp you kind of fall into and, and understand that's the direction things I think things are going to be going. All right, so getting through all those objections then... Let me get to the, the final question that I was asked that I got via email. And the question is, what WordPress e-commerce theme should I use? So my answer to that question is it's not a theme, right? The, the, the e-commerce solution or what you should be looking for isn't a theme. It's a plugin and it's called WooCommerce. And WooCommerce is really kind of the industry standard when it comes to e-commerce solutions. So you should be using e-commerce and then really you can just Google WooCommerce themes or go to Woo themes and the, the company that makes WooCommerce and look at those and, and any theme that's, you know, built by a reputable company and so forth that integrates with WooCommerce, it comes down to the look and feel that you're after. But you want you WooCommerce as kind of the industry standard for an e-commerce site. That's going to give you the base of being able to add products and pricing and shipping and all the stuff that you need to do e-commerce wise. Now, as a caveat to that, something that you might consider is a non-WordPress solution or a solution that integrates with WordPress so if you really want to stick with WordPress, you can still use that. And that solution is Shopify. 
And I say that because I've looked into Shopify for some different clients and so forth and kind of messed around with it a little bit and it's pretty slick. So it takes a lot of the hard work out of it for you. And this is where I get back to, it's okay to use tools. You don't have to build everything from scratch yourself. And if there's a tool out there, that's a better, op I mean, Shopify is like base option, I think is like 30 bucks a month. And it does a lot for 30 bucks a month. Now, if you're thinking about running a serious e-commerce site, the platform on which it's built is going to cost you 30 bucks a month. Uh, yes. Okay. Where do I sign up? That, I mean, if you're really serious about your e-commerce site, that's nothing. Okay. So that's something that you might consider. They have their own platform and designs and stuff that you can work with and they're really pretty good. Or if you're really stuck with WordPress, they do have a WordPress plugin and, and integration that you can use to still work through Shopify. So those are the, the, the kind of the routes that I would look at if I were you. All right. So I'll do it for this episode. I want to thank everybody for listening. If you haven't yet, then be sure to subscribe to the episode so that you never miss an episode. If you like this one, be sure to like it so that I know that you like this kind of content. And if you know someone who would benefit from hearing this, I'd appreciate it if you would share this with them. Also, you might consider becoming a supporting listener over on Patreon. There's a number of perks available for you over there, including freelance templates, uh, exclusive courses that are only available there, priority access to this Q&A right here, and a number of other things. So you can learn more about that at johnmorrisonline.com slash Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thanks again, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.